dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a legend in the world of horror, and I am talking about Ted Nicola, Nicolau. He uh, started out, he was, the sound, he was the sound recorder on the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and then he moved to L.A. and joined Empire Pictures, uh, Charlie Band's company, and he edited many of his classic films like Tourist Trap, The Daytime Ended, Trancers, The Alchemist, you know, those are my personal favorites, and many others. And then he transitioned into directing. Uh, he directed a segment of The Dungeon Master and, of course, that 1986 cult classic, timeless cult classic, I should say, Terror Vision with my free, my friend and frequent guest Diane Franklin and then he transitioned into directing more family oriented stuff for Charlie uh like Remote and Dragon World and Leap and Leprechauns and uh oh and he also did the subspecies movies with Angus Grimm as well and it's going to be great to have him on the show today it's going to be an honor so uh yeah here is my interview with Ted Nicolau. Hey, Ted. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? I'm pretty good. How about you? Is it Tommy? Yep, yeah, it's Tommy. Pretty good. Pretty hey. good. This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, sure, man. Happy to do it. <laughs> awesome. So... Going back in time, did you gravitate toward film early on in your childhood? Uh, you know what? Ed, when I was growing up, my father took me to like the Saturday matinees in Dallas um, every week, and we saw you know all the kind of monster movies and science fiction movies of the fifties uh, together, and that that plus you know the Saturday night uh, late night local TV channel monster marathon movies and the Twilight Zone on Friday nights really gave me a love of, of fantasy films. Mm -hmm. You uh, saw the, the Corman movies and the uh, William Castle and Ray Harryhausen and all that stuff? Yeah, all that stuff plus the universal you know movies of the 30s and 40s too. Oh yeah, <laughs> gotta, gotta have those in the canon. Uh, did you have any personal favorites? Uh, you know, the one film that we went back to see many, many times was Forbidden Planet. Oh. Uh, a movie that I caught on TV that influenced uh, Terror Vision, at least the, the kind of the qualities I was going for in Terror Vision, was uh, a movie called Invaders from Mars. Mm -hmm. It was not the Toby Hooper one, but the original one. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of expressionistic uh, look and a kind of point of view of a kid that nobody believes uh, kind of stuck with me and really haunted me for, the, for my childhood. Yeah, I got to talk to James Drury two weeks before he died, and we talked about Forbidden Planet. Wow, yeah, that was a great movie. My dad was a, was a Freudian psychoanalyst so for him it was sort of like the best of both worlds science fiction and psychoanalysis you know with the id monster yeah pretty uh, groundbreaking for 1956 i have to say yeah yeah it was super cool looking too you know just the, the whole atmosphere of that film was really terrific yeah, even Leslie Nielsen said that he, he was the proudest of that movie. Out of all the movies he did afterwards, he was the proudest of that movie the most. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was reading you went to the University of Texas? Yes, I did, yeah. Uh, I went there, like, to, I was going to be a doctor, mm -hmm. and... Uh, I had been, you know, in rock and roll bands through high school and um, writing poetry and things like that. And when I got to the university, um, I met a guy named Daniel Pearl in some of my classes. Right. And uh, he, he and I became really good friends, and he went on to be the, you know, cinematographer of 
Chainsaw Massacre and many, many other films yep. and commercials. Uh, but we got to be really good friends. And at a certain point, uh, another friend uh, introduced me to, uh, you know, like the film society that was going on in Austin. And I saw a couple of films that kind of changed my path. And uh, one of them was... Um, Juliet of the Spirits by Federico Fellini, and the other was um, A Seventh Seal. Uh, yeah. And those two movies kind of showed me how I could use my love of music, my love of writing, and uh, my love of films, and kind of uh, combine them all into this kind of grand art form. So uh, about that same time, Daniel had decided to switch over to film, too, so we both just kind of jumped ship on the pre-med and got in, involved with the film department at UT, which was really thriving in those days. Yeah, wow. So you played you played music in high school. Uh, what kind of music did you play? Oh, I started out like a folk singer, songwriter in coffee houses uh, when I was like about 15 and then uh, had various kind of bands, a psychedelic band that toured around Texas and Louisiana uh, with a light show and then uh, at the University of Texas I had a band that was like kind of a psychedelic hippie party band that yeah. we played like oldies but with uh, a psychedelic kind of flair to them yeah wow did you see anybody in the coffee houses that later went on to become successful in music uh no you know like uh, Lightning Hopkins would play there sometimes and you know so oh, yeah. there were you know, people would kind of come by, but it was sort of a pretty sad little coffee house. You know, there were only two in, in, in Dallas at the time, and I was playing in the smaller one of them. Yeah, I'm finding out that Lightning Hopkins loved to play coffee houses. I, I interviewed uh, a filmmaker named Howard Zime who uh, directed Flesh Gordon, that porn movie in the 70s, and he owned uh -huh. he owned a folk club um, in the early 60s in San Francisco, and he said Lightning Hopkins used to play there all the time. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty amazing, you know. I guess that was his... I mean, he was old by the time I saw him play. Um, yeah. But he was damn good, man. Yeah. <laughs> so did you did you study any film while you were in um, the University of Texas? Uh, yeah, I jumped over to the film department, and they gave us a really excellent kind of broad education in the history of film, and also there was money to be had from the local uh, educational television station for our uh, shorts. So we kind of had funding and an amazing amount of equipment and courses in, you know, kind of every genre uh, throughout film history. So it was a really terrific film program. Mm -hmm. How did uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre come about for you? Uh, for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I had uh, been working with a guy named Courtney Gooden, who was like the, he was a classmate and also was a great, sound engineer and uh, on a few commercials and you know little crappy features I had been his uh, boom operator and about the time that Toby was crewing up Chainsaw Massacre Daniel Pearl you know was on as director of photography and he and I were friends and Courtney was uh, working on another film was not available to be the sound man on Chainsaw so because I had sort of learned from Courtney uh, they kind of, I was next in line, they interviewed me, and I got the job. Mm -hmm. And um, did, did you ever try to work for Toby again after that? Uh, no, basically after that, uh, Toby, you know, was involved with uh, post-production for like a year, uh, and I was just, I was in grad school by that point, and uh, had a little film production company with Daniel Pearl and Larry Carroll and uh, Courtney Gooden and a guy named Richard Kouris. We had a little film production company, so we were doing uh, little uh, public service announcements and commercials and training films and things like that and trying to get our own feature off the ground as well. Um, and Toby, you know, I was sound man and, and I uh, kept this, the 
you know, my sound logs. And in my sound logs, because I was sort of like a little smart aleck, would sometimes make snide comments in the sound logs, because, mm-hmm. you know, in my opinion, in my history, nobody ever looked at the sound logs. You basically look at the um, script notes. But for some reason, they lost the script notes. And so they were using my sound logs as, uh, as you know, their guide to the, to the footage. And so I think Toby saw some of my comments and probably got, he was pretty pissed off. So I don't think the <laughs> chance of working with Toby was ever there after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've talked to like four people from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. They all seem to hold a uh, bitter resentment towards Toby. They portray him as kind of a monster. <laughs> uh, he was, he was, uh, I didn't think of him as a monster so much as a guy who kind of operated in a fog of confusion and indecision. And yeah. so uh, every shoot day was like hours of waiting around while he made a decision. Um, and, you know, we didn't understand how much he, he kind of had a grip on what he was doing, you know, and, yeah. you know, every movie, once it goes through editing, you know, is transformed into something usually much better than what you imagine it was going to be. So, you know, when we saw the film, it was obvious that Toby was pretty, pretty uh, talented, you know? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, I guess a lot of that resentment maybe came from the the financial yeah. all out of the movie, you know. I think it, uh, Burns especially was disgruntled about that because we all had a piece of the film because it uh, went over schedule and they didn't have the money to pay people's uh, salaries mm-hmm. for the, the couple of weeks that uh, we shot beyond the schedule. So we all got a little piece of the film. And... You know, after the first release, the Bryanson release, which I think, you know, all the money was stolen by Bryanson. After that, I think, uh, you know, the, the bookkeeping of that film is pretty spectacularly honest because I still get a little money every now and then from it. No, that's good. That's good. Do, do you remember audience reaction of the movie from the theaters? Not really, you know, I don't, I probably saw it once and then that was about it, you know, I mean, it was definitely uh, unlike any other movie that anybody had ever seen and it definitely captured a certain kind of terror that the hippies of Texas had uh, when they would venture outside of Austin into the backwoods of, you know, like Hill Country, Texas, because that, that really... (laughs) <laughs> the, that that was possible back in those days, you know. Not quite as crazed as Chainsaw Massacre, but you could run into some pretty odd people out there. Yeah, my, my dad was 17. He went to go see the movie in the theater, and he saw kids younger than him, uh, like, running and, and vomiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the film definitely... Had a it, it had the kind of creepy vibe that Toby sort of had too. You know, it was it just seemed like a crazy old man kind of that movie. Yeah, <laughs> it's an immortal classic. So did you? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, did so? Did you move to LA after that? Uh, I stuck around Austin long enough to get my master's degree and um, to to you know try to develop some films, but the, by the, after Chainsaw Massacre, the kind of tax breaks that were available for film investment mm-hmm. uh, had sort of lapsed, and so there was not as much money going around for movie making. So uh, around 1976, a lot of my friends started bailing on Austin and coming out to L.A. and finding work, and they started telling me I should come out to Los Angeles, and I could uh, get a job and you know make movies and so at a certain point like 1977 I kind of packed my van which was basically the Chainsaw Massacre van that was used in the movie packed it up with all my junk and uh, drove out like the Beverly Hillbillies to Los Angeles <laughs> and got a job on a movie called Roar mm-hmm. which is kind of the infamous lion and tiger movie of Toby of uh, of uh, that uh, Tippi Hedren yeah. yeah that uh, how does Empire come into the picture uh, on, on, we worked on Roar for 
you know, like eight or nine months. And uh, one of the people that hired me on Roar was Larry Carroll, who was uh, serving as editor on on the film. And uh, I came on, started editing, and then Larry left to uh, to produce a movie called Tourist Trap. Yeah. And um, at a certain point, he and David Schmoller asked if I wanted to come and cut the Tourist Trap. So I came over, I quit Roar, came over and started working on Tourist Trap. And that's how I kind of first met Charlie Band. Mm hmm. Yeah, you edited some of my favorites uh, from Empire, including Tourist Trap and um, <coughs> the, uh, the Daytime Ended, which I'm probably the only person who's ever seen that one. <laughs> might be the only person who even likes that film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's got such a 1950s cheesy sci-fi vibe to it, you know? It, yeah, yeah, definitely does. Yeah, yeah. That movie, you know, after Tourist Trap, uh, Charlie uh, was in trouble with Daytime Ended. The director had quit, the editor had quit, and mm -hmm. the movie was unfinished. And so he asked me to see if I could come in and, and sort it out and... So I did that, and that kind of, you know, then Charlie and I started becoming friends after that. Yeah, and also The Alchemist, that's probably my favorite Empire movie. I, I talked to uh, Alan Adler, who wrote it uh, earlier this year, and then, um, of course, you did Ghoulies, Zone Troopers, and Trancers. I love that one. That's a great Trancers was kind of a step up for, for Charlie's productions, I think, you know, and that, that movie... Because uh, Danny Bilson and Paul DeMeo uh, wrote the script, and they are really talented writers and have a really great handle on kind of genre conventions and period movies and film noir and stuff. And so they they gave that film a really good script, and then Mac Albert, <laughs> you know, gave it an incredible look, and Charlie directed it, and yeah, that was a fun one to edit. It's a pretty short movie. It's a pretty short movie. Was anything cut? Uh, no, back those in those days, the scripts were pretty short, and uh, I'm sure something was cut, but I don't remember what. Now that was a, you know, the the editing style at Empire was, you know, Charlie was kind of ran the company. His father Albert Band, who was a director in his own right and had been an assistant to. Uh, to John Houston and was an old Hollywood guy, uh, he would sort of uh, step into the cutting room, you know, near the end and help people kind of uh, tighten up their films. And so he could always find 10 minutes to take out of a movie to, to quicken up the pace. So, you know, between the, the short screenplays, the shooting schedules that were so tight that, you know, you had to leave a lot of stuff behind but when you're shooting uh, all those all those movies tend to be a little short yeah how, how was um, editing uh, the tourist trap it seems like it, it was a little tricky tourist trap was uh, tricky only from the perspective of trying to you know uh, work with all of the mannequins and uh, yeah you know, uh, make that kind of as eerie as possible and create a sound environment that, that uh, kind of helped the, the, the crazy atmosphere. But, uh, you know, Schmoller is like a, he's a talented director. He knows how to shoot and how to shoot so that so his, the things cut together. Um, I had been, he was another classmate of mine at the University of Texas. And uh, he, uh, I had been a, director of photography on a film that he did um so so we knew each other and and uh, so you know that was a it was a pretty good experience at that movie yeah i mean it's so it's so unique in that it builds up tension and suspense and fear without uh, being a slasher film and i think if if someone else had handled it it probably would have been a slasher film uh yeah yeah david was more of a surrealist than he was a horror filmmaker uh, and he had some kind of weird fascination with mannequins uh, from even before that film. So, you know, that was his, you know, he, he, it was his personal statement, that movie. 
Mm-hmm. So g- getting into the movies uh, you directed, uh, you directed a segment of the Dungeon Master called Desert Pursuit. Yeah. Uh, basically, I was editing the, the film, uh, and dun- uh, Dungeon Master was kind of Charlie's testing ground for future directors because he, his master plan was to start Empire and uh, make a number of movies every year and more than he could possibly direct himself. So he had, you know, all the directors that were, that he had his eye on. Uh, and I was not one of them. Uh, I was the editor and, you know, working on all those segments, you know, thinking, Jesus, I could do better than this. Uh, and when the film was finally put together, it was still too short in the running time. And so I proposed to Charlie that I'd I could direct one episode, and uh, he took a chance on me. Yeah, did you learn a lot from uh, making that uh, segment? Uh, I learned a lot uh, about how you uh, how you can get screwed by circumstances and still have to figure out a way to to finish your shooting day. I mean, mm-hmm. I had I had directed a, a bunch of films in. In, uh, at the university, and that was really my, you know, my end goal was to direct movies, not to be an editor, but editing seemed to be a good way to kind of practice the craft and learn at, as I went. Uh, but on on uh, the Dungeon Master segment, you know, we had an incredible location, and, and, you know, it was like a little bit of a Mad Max ripoff at a super-duper low budget. Yeah. But at the last... On the second day of shooting, the um, the moment where the two cars are supposed to collide and explode, uh, one of the cars ceased to function. And so I was left with the dilemma of, you know, the sun is going down. I've got to finish this sequence somehow. How can I, you know, fake this collision to make it, you know, so, so I could cut something together? Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's why you see there's like a zoom in there, and, and you know it's kind of funky the, uh, the the way the two cars collide. Um, and and I did it because I have a lot of faith in editing and how editing can can um, fix a lot of technical problems. And Charlie appreciated that I did just call him up and say, hey, you know what, fuck this, we have to shoot another day. I need another day of shooting to to make it work and somehow made it work within the two days that I was given to begin with. So that that's when he, I, he really appreciated that. And uh, that sort of set me up for, um, you know, uh, more editing for a while and then eventually some more directing for him. Mm-hmm. And you got to work with another guest of mine, Felix Silla. Wait a minute! Well, what movie? On the uh, on on the um, uh, Desert Pursuit and Dungeon Master. He's, oh he, yeah 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 okay yeah yeah. He's cousin uh, in yeah. the Ams family. <laughs> uh huh. That's funny, man. Yeah. No, the, the the cast of that movie was like he was the little man. Yeah. Yeah, he's cousin it. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious, man. Because uh, we <laughs> we went out there. And uh, I had arranged with Charlie to get a hotel room uh, out uh, near the location. Yeah. And uh, he, Felix didn't have a hotel room. So in the end, he and I shared my room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, Felix is really cool. He's got a lot of great stories. I, I tell people, you know, uh, who do like who do these type of podcasts. I say, put Felix on your show. He's got so many great old Hollywood stories. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious, man! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet he didn't tell that one about how he, he stayed, spent the night in my hotel room, huh? <laughs> no, I, I don't even think we talked about Dungeon Master. We talked about so many. <laughs> He's so prolific. I had to like choose, you know, certain ones. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. So what's the genesis behind Terror Vision? Terror Vision uh, started like almost all of the Empire films. It started with a poster that Charlie commissioned, mm-hmm. and the poster was Monster in a, coming out of a TV set. 
And uh, when he decided to give me another shot at directing, um, he pulled out that poster and said, here, what do you think of this? And you just kind of look at it. And, and by that time, I had worked with John Beekler enough that I knew the, his strengths and also his uh, limitations. And mm -hmm. I knew kind of the budgetary kind of constraints of, of working on an Empire film. And, uh, and I asked Charlie if I, if I could make it a comedy. And, you know, even though he's not really known for comedies, he said yes. Uh, and so I basically took that image of a monster coming out of a TV set and wrote a screenplay that was kind of in, embodied you know, a lot of things about my love of, of um, 1950s monster movies and my kind of vision of what was going on in Los Angeles at the time in terms of uh, the music scene and the swinger scene and the, and the survivalism and, and kind of jumbled it all together into this satire about uh, television and um, monster from outer space. So that that's that was sort of the genesis of it, and it kind of goes back to my desire to to do a movie a little bit that had a little bit of the vibe of of uh, Invaders from Mars, yeah, and uh, create something that that if you saw caught a little bit of on television, you would just go, "What the hell was that?" You know? Yeah, yeah. To me, it's it's it's, it's a send up of of nineteen fifties families, but in a weird alternate nineteen eighties setting. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah it's true. The, yeah. The, the elaborate yeah. colors and, and everything, it reminds me of something that John Waters would come up with. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were sort of working in, at, you know, in the same kind of milieu. And, and really, you know, a lot of that movie kind of, the script was the script, and it's pretty accurate to the movie that was eventually made. But the the talents that came in and contributed to the to the film like Giovanni Natalucci, the uh, Italian production designer, uh, he came to Los Angeles and we looked at a lot of houses, valley houses, and talked about swingers, and we looked at survivalist magazines, and and uh, you know I kind of filled his head with a lot of uh, visual images and ideas, and he went back to Rome and started designing and came up with that incredible house and uh you know so so the house itself has a, a, like such a intense kind of ambience to it that that contributed to the film and then the casting you know the casting of garrett graham and mary warrenoff uh and diane franklin and jonathan grise uh, all of that really you know took whatever was in the script and kind of amplified it a hundredfold. Yeah, I mean... That movie was a great accident of many parts kind of coming together and creating something that, that was pretty universally hated when it first came out. Uh, but uh, because I guess because it's so unique, it's sort of... Uh, I was really happy that it's that the cult around it kind of... But grew and grew and grew even today there are people that are getting turned on to that film but but wasn't every empire movie with the exception of maybe reanimator um was um was universally hated by all <laughs> <laughs> you know maybe so but when it's your own movie and my you know i thought terrorism was you know it's like a, it's flawed like every one of my movies I, I take no great ego you know in in those movies but they're but it but I loved the film, and it was kind of a work of work of great, uh, uh, you know, affection. And uh, when that when it comes out, and, and it just gets kind of like such crappy reviews, it hurts, man. It hurts for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, Diane Franklin, she's been a guest on here for a record of seven times, including my very wow. my very first interview. Yes. She didn't know me, we never met, and she was my first interview, and then I would go through periods in the first year of doing this show where I had trouble getting guests, and every time I asked her to come back on, she would. Um, we, we did a quarantine one uh, a few months back, which was great, 
But uh, I talked to her uh, the other day, and she said that uh, she wants uh, she wants uh, me to uh, tell you that Susie gives you her love. Oh, good! I tell her I love her, man. She was so such a trooper on that film, and she's such a great person. You know, even at like horror conventions when our paths have crossed and we oh. have to sit together, you know, she's just got such a such great energy. You know, and yeah. and you know she. She took that character and really submitted to, you know, multiple wigs and an incredible makeup job and really brought her to life in a funny, cute way, you know? Yeah. So, so did you see her in something and say, I want her for the role? No, she came in, you know, we were, we, we interviewed like Belinda Carlisle uh, <laughs> from the Go-Go's and, yeah. you know, a lot of people. And uh, she came in and just nailed it uh, in in her audition, and um, so that was it. I, I had not seen Last American Virgin or, or you know any of her work. Yeah, oh, she's great in everything she's done. Um, yeah, you got Garrett Graham, Mary Warrenov, you know, uh, Bert Remsen. I interviewed Bert's uh, daughter Carrie a couple years ago. She told me she was on location with him on this. Wow, yeah, yeah. That was the great thing. I mean, you know, I, I love to think that everybody was attracted to the screenplay, uh, but I think the idea of going to Italy for a couple of months was uh, also a great incentive. And, yeah, we had some really beautiful dinners, you know. out. You know, part of the crew was staying at a hotel in a town called Torvionica, a beach town, and a hotel on the beach with an incredible restaurant on the on a terrace and every night was just like these long beautiful dinner parties yeah is it true that you wanted either Frank Zappa or Lux Interior for the soundtrack yeah it is uh, I screened it for both of those guys Lux Interior was about to go on a tour with um, with uh, Rain Parade I think or something and so he couldn't do it Frank Zappa looked at the film and had his wife and his son there and uh, and said, how, when do you need it by? And, and the, the schedule was just too tight for him. Yeah. But, I mean, God, I can't imagine what that movie could have been with the Zappa soundtrack. It would have been amazing, you know? Oh, yeah. It, it probably could have. At, at least he liked it, though. I mean, he liked weird stuff, from what I've been told. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, but we were super <coughs> lucky to, to get the um, Fibonacci's to do the, the title song and some of the incidental music in the film, too. Mm -hmm. and I, I had been seeing them at uh, playing around town uh, and really liked their, their, the style of their music. And so that was a cool, that was cool that we were able to get them. Yeah, it came out on Valentine's Day, too. Do you think if it, it waited a little bit longer, maybe it would have been liked? Maybe it would have been liked if the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded with the teacher on board. So I think the the mood of the country was not all that uh, upbeat at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, Charlie was trying to distribute those movies uh, himself through Empire. And they kind of bit off more than they could chew to try to release three films. They, they released, uh, what was it, Troll and, um, and Eliminators and Terrorvision, like, you know, just a couple of weeks apart, three movies, and there wasn't enough uh, advertising money. And, you know, it just was a, a, a terrible bunch of circumstances. Yeah. I, I look at all the movies that came out during that period, and yeah, that Challenger really soured the, the mood of, of the world during that time. The closest thing to a box office hit that came out during that time was Down Out in Beverly Hills. And wow, uh -huh. that movie actually, actually did pretty well at the box office. It made like $100 million worldwide. Um, it came out uh, that weekend of, of the Challenger. But like everything else that came out afterwards just didn't do well for some reason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was a bad, that was a, I mean, everybody was really, that was a very sad week, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it was. Were, were you discouraged um, that it didn't do well, so uh, so you, you waited a while before directing again? Uh, I was super discouraged. 
college, I was like, you know, I just kind of built furniture at a friend's house for a, a little time just to kind of to have something else to do. But I was ready to do another movie, but um, I kind of got stuck in development hell trying to develop a few different titles at Empire and writing scripts that, you know, never saw the light of day. So that's that was the main reason for like that one or two years or whatever it was between television and the next film I got to do. Mm -hmm. And then you got to do Subspecies. Yeah, so then uh, a, a, a Romanian expatriate who had been living in Los Angeles came to Charlie after the revolution, you know, that kind of toppled uh, Ceausescu and proposed to him that he could put together a deal where the Romanian film uh, studio would pay for the Romanian cost if Charlie would pay for the American cost. And I think they, he first asked Stuart Gordon if he wanted to go uh, shoot a movie in Romania, and Stuart said they passed on it. And so I was sort of the next in line, and uh, I said, yeah, let me, I'll go over there and check it out and see if it's possible. And so they sent me over for a week to kind of meet uh, the people that would be involved and scout locations. And once I saw the locations, I was pretty much... Uh, hooked and ready to go, you know, because the, the thought that you could shoot in some of these incredible historic places uh, was too much to pass up. And I was not a big uh, vampire fan at that point, you know, I was more of a Frankenstein fan, and vampire movies I thought were kind of boring, but, um, but the script was interesting enough, and the, you know, once I started imagining how to make a vampire movie, you know, all of the, the, you know, resonant qualities of being a vampire started jumping out at me, and I realized what a kind of profound uh, genre it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was it like working with Angus Grimm? Uh, Angus was a very sweet man. He, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he unfortunately sort of came in in the middle of a shoot that was kind of filled with disgruntled actors and people unhappy with the, the circumstances that they, that they found themselves in. And so, you know, midway through the shoot, here comes Angus Scrim, whose plane got diverted to some godforsaken other airport and had to drive hours and hours to get to Bucharest. And he was only <laughs> scheduled to be there for a couple of days of shooting. And um, so, you know, I had not cast him, but he was kind of like cast after I was already uh, in pre-production on the film. Uh, so I met him when he finally arrived on the set, and uh, I was kind of a little bit taken aback because uh, remembering him as the, uh, as the undertaker, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, mean, I thought of him as a very sinister character, and he came in, and he was so sweet that I was like, holy shit, what am I going to do with this man? Uh, and and then, you know, we had to figure out how to transform him into something that, that could have been Radu's father. So hence came the too many wigs and uh, all of that. But, yeah, the... the, the rest of the cast was so kind of, was not very nice to him, or, or at least uh, uh, Honest was nice to him, but um, Michael Watson was not very, was not very uh, generous as an actor to him. Oh. So, we had to spend a little time just kind of keeping everybody focused on the work. Uh, I, I talked to um, M uh, Michael Baldwin from the Phantasm movies, uh, one of my most difficult interviews, by the way, and he, I, 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 made some laughter provoke I provoked some laughter laughter from him when I said to him I said uh was was Angus Grimm the kind of guy who played pranks on his co-stars on set and he laughed and he was like oh no he was serious he was in character the whole time he was very dedicated to that character the tall man oh that's funny yeah <laughs> that, yeah I mean because that that is a great character and and he was transformed because he was not at all that kind of character in person, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
You've done what three or four of the subspecies movies? Uh, four so far, and and we're you know if this pandemic ever ends, we're going to go to Serbia and shoot like a prequel to the films. Nice, nice, yeah. That would be great to keep the series going, especially now uh, people are starting to make sequels to uh, movies that they did many years ago, you know, long-weighted sequels. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this I wrote the, you know, the original prequel, like, God, back way a long time ago. Uh, and uh, we've just sat on it all these years because Charlie didn't have the money really to... to uh, produce it at any level that's even close to what the original films, the original films were super inexpensive, but because Romania was so so cheap to shoot, you know, the money went a long way. Mm -hmm. but, um, but now I think we finally maybe have a place to shoot and, and a budget that, that we can kind of at least meet some of our ambitions for the film. Oh, that's good, yeah. How about making Bad Channels? Uh, Bad Channels was a movie that, after Terrorvision, I kind of uh, uh, resisted uh, Bad Channels. Charlie proposed it to me a couple of times, and it just seemed like too, too much of a kind of a cheap copy of Terrorvision uh, for radio. So I resisted it and resisted it until finally I was like desperate to, to work after the the kind of. Um, uh, like development hell that I had gone through trying to write uh, some other scripts for them because they were uh, at, by that point they were doing you know those kind of odd titled comedies mm -hmm. and um, so I was writing some comedies for them and they just weren't weren't working out so basically uh, I finally said yes to to bad channels and I'm glad I did actually because I it was a really uh, enjoyable film to make, you know, to, to have uh, music on the set and to uh, to work with uh, Paul Hip and, uh, you know, and Martha Quinn. It was, like, really a fun movie to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how'd you get Ron Keel? Um, Ron Keel. He's the heavy metal guy. Oh, uh, the, there was a guy named um, uh, Pat Siciliano uh, who was kind of in charge of the music and he uh, kind of found some various bands and then would send me out to go hear them at their rehearsal spaces uh, and um, you know we like went and listened to a number of bands and, and uh, I liked his I liked his band and I liked the, the girls that played with him it was uh, you know just one of those things that we needed bands of different genres and he had a really good kind of stage presence mm -hmm. yeah he's he, he he went from like he i think he did like country music when he was like in high school and then he went into rock oh, really and, yeah and then he went back to country for a long time and now he's back to rock <laughs> yeah that's funny man because he because he went by ronnie lee keel when he was doing country Mm hmm Michael Huddleston's in it. I've been trying to find him for an interview. I can't find him. Yeah, I don't know what's happened to him. I haven't heard from him in a really long time. I worked with his dad on a... D David? Uh, yeah. A, yeah, on an Italian TV series called uh, Lucky Luke. And um, his dad was a handful, but Michael was really, really a nice guy. Oh, wow. And funny, really funny. Well, his father played a lot of characters who were a handful. Like, he's the grandpa in the Wonder Years, and that character was a handful on there. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, I guess he was uh, typecast, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he, he, was, he was tough. Oh, wow. So what, what made you depart from the horror and sci-fi genre into doing family-oriented stuff? You know, um, uh, at a certain point, Charlie had... had uh, some kids, mm -hmm. and his wife Debbie Dion, uh, I think, wanted to do fantasy films for kids, and so they started that branch of, of uh, Full Moon called uh, Moonbeam. Mm -hmm. And 
Let's see. Yeah, it was Moonbeam, right? Yeah, I mean, it was full moon. It wasn't Empire. It was full moon, yeah, because Empire had collapsed. Right. Uh, and so uh, because, you know, I had kids and uh, I, I didn't always set out to make just horror films. I really set out to make legitimate, all different kinds of movies. So when the opportunity came to do Dragon World uh, and to shoot it in the U.K., and, um, you know, it was just too great an opportunity to pass up, you know. And mm-hmm. so I, I sort of imagine myself as a as a fantasy filmmaker, whether the fantasies are nightmarish fantasies or, or benevolent fantasies of kids' movies. So, so it wasn't that big a shift in my own uh, imagination of what I, what I set out to do. It was just a... Uh, a matter of creating a different sort of a mood on the set and, and having a, you know, collaborators that were really uh, young, you know? And yeah. That's, that brings about its own set of kind of uh, stresses, you know, trying to get performances out of kids. <laughs> yeah. I know. I heard that's one of the hardest things to do is to get a performance out of a kid on set. Yeah, it definitely, you know, it's... It takes a lot of work, uh, but you know the Dragon World was, you know, for me like a really, really special uh, movie making experience working with with uh, the cast and uh, the creatures and all, and all the people that were operating the creature. You know, it was really cool. Mm-hmm. Until we had to, we went from uh, shooting in the UK and then going over budget because the weather was so unpredictable until they ended up sending us to Romania to finish the film and then it became more of a of a chore you know mm-hmm. yeah you did remote Dragon World Leaping Leprechauns with um, Grant Kramer who's been on the show he's a great guy oh cool yeah 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 Leaping Leprechauns that was another a really fun one I mean but for me the you know, horror movies, you get to create this incredible atmosphere and and uh, imagine terrible things. With uh, kids' movies, you have to create a different kind of an atmosphere and uh, kind of maintain a sense of awe toward the world. So f- for me, uh, Leap and Leprechauns was another, you know, incredibly beautiful experience just working. I mean, English actors, there's nothing quite like working with an English cast, you know, because they're they're used to touring about the country and staying in crappy hotels, and so being in Romania is not a big problem for for most of them, you know. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> and they they form a really great troupe of of, of actors, and so and then trying to figure out for Leap and Leprechauns all of the. Uh, first perspective shots was a challenge and a really, you know, like a pleasurable challenge. Mm-hmm. How, how was making uh, Puppet Master versus Demonic Toys? Oh, Puppet Master versus Demonic Toys was a nightmare uh, <laughs> that I should have said no to, but I was so, it had been a while since I had gotten to direct a film and I was doing like uh, bonus features for Disney DVDs was sort of my sideline. Uh, and when I got the call to do it, I, I jumped at it. And even knowing that I really do not like puppet movies, I don't like working with puppets, and um, I should have been kind of a little more careful about the producer and the, you know, the it was it, the whole thing was was kind of a nightmare from start to finish. Yeah, it had certain moments that that were fun. Uh, and, um, you know, some of the cast I liked a lot. Uh, Corey Feldman was kind of a handful to work with. Yeah. Um, and the, the locations just... in Bulgaria were not as inspiring as the locations in, in Romania. And uh, the, produ- the production was very kind of uh, trying to cut the budget every time I turned around. So, so it was... That movie was pretty much of a fight from start to finish. Oh, wow. Because I, I just talked to Vanessa Angel, and she said she had a great time making it. I loved her. She was really, really 
fun to work with. Uh, that's that, uh, good that she said that, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. She was like one of the bright points. And uh, Sylvia Suvadova, who was, you know, t- all sadly, sadly miscast as the uh, American policewoman, yeah. but was a phenomenal actress and a really, really wonderful person to, to hang out with. Uh, you know, so there were those little bright spots. You know, for me, it's like once you start working with your, with your cast, you know, as long as you don't have one bad apple in the cast, you know, there's like moments of joy on the set always. Mm-hmm, absolutely. It's synergy, as they call it. Yeah. So do you have any upcoming projects or anything that got shelved because of the pandemic? Oh, I have a, uh, like a uh, supernatural shocker that uh, we're trying to raise money for that just keeps getting pushed and pushed and pushed because, you know, nobody wants to commit money right now mm-hmm. to any movies. I've got the subspecies uh uh, prequel that um, that we're ready to ready to do as soon as we can, um, and you know I've got some other scripts that I'm working on, and always have something that I'm doing, but you know nothing nothing is concrete yet. Yeah, well that's good. At least you uh, have projects that uh, you want to make and stuff. Um, in the last year or so, we've lost two Empire greats, uh, John Carl Beekler and uh, Stuart Gordon. Uh, what can you say about those guys? Uh, I can say Stuart Gordon was like an inspiration for all of us that were working at Empire in those days. Uh, he was a guy who was, you know, really generous with uh, his praise and with with everybody's, uh, you know, other, the other movies that were going on. He uh, was a true director of actors and uh, knew very well what he was doing. Um, he was a provocateur in the movies that he made. Uh, I, I got to edit uh, Robot Jocks for him and um, really enjoyed that process. Uh, Stuart was, yeah, that was a super loss for Stuart to go so soon, you know. Yeah. Uh, John Beekler <clears throat> was another really talented guy for Charlie. He was a, he was a bit more of an oddball yeah. uh, than Stuart was. And, um, you know, he and I butted heads a lot uh, um, in the making of Terrorvision, you know, and just the design of the creature. But... You know what, he came through in the end, he kind of gave me what I was asking for, uh, even though it wasn't quite what he envisioned. Uh, But uh, another guy that's like sad that he's gone because he was prolific in, you know, creating monsters and sculptures and uh, seemed to always have a film project going too, you know. So, yeah, Mm -hmm. no, it's it's sad when, when the people around you start passing, you know. Oh, it is, yeah. I mean, especially since, you know, there's this um, selfishness that you have that you you lose people that you love because you feel that they have so much more to teach you. Yeah, yeah. And Stuart was really, really good. And and I always, you know, he always invited me to see screenings of the the movies he made after Empire and um, Full Moon. and, And, you know, he was really talented. Yeah, I never got to meet either of those two, unfortunately. Um, oh man! But they, I've admired them always. You know, they've they they contributed so much to the horror genre. You know, and, and John Carl Beekler. You know, I mean, he he made Kane Hodder's career. He got him Jason. You know, because they had done something together. I guess at Empire or New World or something like that. And he suggested uh, Kane Hodder for the job. Wow! Wow! That's cool. Yeah, so he made Kane Hodder the the horror icon that he is. But um, wow, yeah, and you've certainly uh, made a huge contribution to the genre too, Ted. And I thank you so much for coming on today. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Tommy. Uh, and um, you take care of yourself, man. Oh, you too, sir. Stay safe because we need you. And I will uh, <laughs> keep an eye out, you know, for future projects. Yeah, please do, man. Awesome, awesome. Have a great day. Okay, you too. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye.
Well, there you have it. Ted Nicolau. Ain't he a cool dude? What a nice guy, huh? And just, he's got great stories, and he's out there still making projects. I like him a lot. Great guy. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Oh, by the way, happy birthday to guests Deborah Gordon. Uh, her birthday was yesterday, and today is Mary Mara's birth. Today is Mary Mara's birthday, so happy birthday, ladies! Love you both, and later, dudes. <laughs>